here really bad. It's, it's a symbolic representation of the fullness of what they have done and the perfection of what God is going to do in his judgment against them. Okay? Questions? No, it helps to understand. Okay. All right. So, uh, when we look at those things, that's, that's something we need to keep in mind because he uses this formula a lot in the first couple of chapters. Um, so, we are in chapter 2. Pull out my chapter two notes. I have these all on my G drive. <laughs> and I gotta go back to the table of contents to get back to my uh, chapter two. Are, all you, right. are these notes that you made when you were in school? Yes. Oh, yeah. oh. Yep. Uh, so we are in Amos chapter two. Yep, we are in Judah, right? So this whole time, uh, Amos has been prophesying against the surrounding nations that have felt like, or that to Israel. Remember, here's, here's, let's redefine our terminology real quick. What is Israel in this context? Uh, where is Israel? And what is Israel in this context? Oh, the northern ten tribes. Northern ten tribes. Uh, what is Judah in this context? The tribe of Judah. No. And the tribe of Judah is the southern two tribes. Yeah. yeah. Is, is the kingdom. These are kingdoms we're talking about. So, yes. So we have, remember, so there are 12 tribes here, but there's that, there's that 13th tribe that makes 13 total, right? Who's the 13th tribe? Levi. Levi. Why is Levi kind of singled out here? They don't have land. They don't have land. So where do we get the 12 tribes from? The 12 landed tribes. Uh, Joseph has two Joseph sons. gets two because mm -hmm. of what he did. Ephraim and Manasseh. So you'll, you won't find a tribe of Joseph. Why? Even though Joseph was one of the sons of J uh, Jacob, right? Yeah. You won't find him in the list of tribes. So Unless you look Judah for Ephraim and Manasseh. Is Manasseh uh, Judah is, is made up of Judah, uh, Judah and Manasseh and Benjamin? No, no, Judah and Benjamin. Because remember, they're the, only, they're the southern Just two the tribes. Just the two of them. Judah yeah, and Benjamin. Benjamin. Right? Um, the rest of them, this is Zebulun, uh, Seth, um, Issachar. Issachar, Ephraim and Manasseh, all those guys are up here. In the ten tribe, the, the Israel. Okay, so this whole time, um, let's see, I'll do Ephraim. I just have a question. How come there are so many? Uh, the first one has ten tribes. Okay, Israel. Yep. How come Judah only have two tribes? That's where the split was. So when the split happened. The ten tribes aligned themselves with the king that said he was heir to the throne of David. And then the other ones who understood who the true heir of the throne of David was, they stuck here. Mm -hmm. Okay? That makes a really complex thing, like more simple than it probably should be. But that's essentially what the tribe, the, they split over. The kingdom split. Okay? So you have the righteous kings, mostly righteous kings, in the south. That's why they don't get exiled in uh, with the rest of the ten tribes. They get exiled in 586 BC okay, instead of 722. All right, so those are some of our terms. Now they have been, uh, Israel has been cheering so far, at least we <laughs> think they could be cheering so far, for what Amos is saying because Amos is prophesying against all of the nations that are surrounding Israel that have been giving Israel problems. Moab is one of them. Uh, Assyria is another one. Tyre and, and all these other places. Um, and he's saying, okay, look, these people for three sins and for four, which we said means what? For three 
and for 4 means a fullness of transgression and the perfection of judgment of that transgression. Perfect judgment. Okay? That's what it's getting at. So, uh, all of these places have had a fullness of the transgression. Perfect judgment is coming for them. As an Israelite, as an ancient Near Eastern person, you would understand what is being said here. It's not like it's being, it's not like it's mystic or anything. These are idioms again. Um, so, they, all of these surrounding nations are being really um, pounded by God. And now, because of, because of what they've done, they're being judgment, and the judgment will not relent. That's the important thing. Because of its fullness, God needs to render perfect judgment, and there is nothing they can do to get rid to forestall the judgment, okay? It's going to happen. So now, the biggest cheer of all probably goes up, because now Judah is going to get it too. Judah is going to get their judgment. So let's, let's read this. Um, we're going to be in verse 4. So, um, I'm gonna, my notes here in the ASB, so I'm going to read out of the ASB. Um, Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Judah and for four I will not revoke its punishment, because they have rejected the law of the Lord and have not kept his statutes. Their lies also have led them astray, those after which their fathers walked, so I will send upon Judah, and it will consume the citadels of Jerusalem. So, Unlike some of these other nations that are being charged with violence or with uh, doing slavery or with doing those kind of things, what's unique here, do you think, about what Amos is saying against Judah? It's not about violence. What is it about? Worshiping the other God? It's about their theology, yeah. There's, their, their charge is a, is a theological one. The, the object of their worship is not right the way that they're conducting themselves according to law is not right. And so we have a theological judgment against Judah for not worshiping the right thing. Mm -hmm. And they're the same as false gods, it says. They've, they've gone after false gods, yep. They haven't, uh, they've rejected the covenant of Yahweh. They've not been kept, the Mosaic laws. Um, uh, this charge would have been denied by Judah, but apparently the sins against Yahweh were characterized, which characterized Israel. Remember, what is Israel doing? What are the northern ten tribes doing that is Worshipping so Baal. They're worshipping Baal, but they're calling him Yahweh and yeah. they're ascribing all of the good things that are happening to them to Baal, right? What is another big issue that they have? They have our two different temples. Mm -hmm. One in Dan and one in Bethel or Bethel. something like yep. that. What's ironic about the temple in Bethel? What does Bethel mean? House of God. House of God. Right. Okay. So, um, so the sins that we find in Israel that are so problematic are taking place to a degree in Judah. Okay? And so this is what is uh, really grinding the gears of, of God, so to speak, is that this is it's happening. Okay? So, um, if we look at places like uh, Jeremiah chapter 3, we'll see, uh, I think it's 6 through 10, um, we'll see that um, Judah has had this problem. Also in Ezekiel, pretty much the whole 23rd chapter is all about how Judah has gone after foreign gods. Um, They've rejected the law of the Lord. Um, the, uh, this rejection <coughs> in Hebrew um, is to reject or refuse someone or something, like here it's, it's rejecting God's law, um, but it can also be for God refusing to reject his people. Now this is not how it's being used. It's the first one. So we see Israel reject, or excuse me, Judah rejecting the law of the Lord in such a way as that they're not keeping it. 
Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, um, the laws and statutes are pretty clear. That's speaking about the law that we find in the first part of the Tanakh. Um, they've been led astray by their lies, which falsehood, deceptive, um, it emphasizes an action or a word that is false because it violates God's character, God's word, uh, his deed, or uh, how he has expressed himself through his prophets or his creation. Okay, so that's, that's how you can... interesting. You said Jeremiah <coughs> three, mm -hmm. and and the tenth verse that says, uh, well, ninth verse, because she took her wardom lightly, she polluted the land, committing adultery with stone and tree. Uh -huh. Yet for all this, her treacherous city Judah did not return to me with her whole heart, mm -hmm. but in pretense. Mm -hmm. And when you just say, you know. Like, yeah. like lies. Yep. Pretense. Yep. Pretending to, but not. Yep. So, um, again, we see this phrase, their fathers walked as their fathers walked. Remember, walking in uh, the, the, the Jewish mind is the same as acting. Okay? So, go back to Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Right? Um, walking is... is it, living living out that's why we call the christian life the christian walk we have that same kind of we've adopted that idiom into our language it's the way that we live and so they're not walking um after the ways that are they're walking after the ways of their fathers which is to be saying being led astray okay um so uh verse five is a reference here to the babylonian exile so if you look in verse five it says so i will send fire upon judah and it will consume the citadels of Jerusalem. What do you think Nebuchadnezzar did to Jerusalem? We see that he did this historically. It's reported. Mm -hmm. He burned it. He destroyed the temple. Yeah, 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 he destroyed the first temple. He burned Jerusalem to the ground. So that when they went back under Darius, when, Israel, when Judah, what's left of Judah, what's left of Israel, went back under Darius the first. Um, we see that it's, it's overrun by the enemy that they have to kick out, and it's in massive disrepair. Like, this is a huge rebuilding project. Okay? So, we got that going. But yeah, verse 5 is that, that coming judgment that is going to be as a result of what Judah has done. Okay? She's right here. Oh, oh, she just went to what verse we're on. Five. That was verse five. Yeah, verse five. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so now verse six. Um, this is where the fingers are now turned to Israel. And again, by Israel we mean the northern ten tribes. The northern ten tribes have been flourishing. They have been financially growing They've been prosperous. They've been, um, they've, you know, just uh, a, a dominant force on the world stage for a long time. And um, they think that this is because they have finally figured out how to worship God the right way. And that God is happy with the way that they're worshiping and all of that. And here's the rub. He's not. And so now Amos goes from being Israel's favorite prophet <laughs> to... Their least favorite prophet, okay? Here's, here's where it starts. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions and for four. So again, what are we saying? Seven. Fullness of transgression, perfect judgment. Okay? For three transgressions and for four. I will not revoke its punishment, its judgment, because they sell the righteous for money and the needy for a pair of sandals. Those who pant after the very dust of the earth on the head of the helpless, and turn aside the way of the humble. Um, and the man and his father uh, resort to the same girl in order to profane my holy name. Um, on garments taken as pledges, they stretch out beside every altar. And in the house of their God, they drink the wine of those who have been fined. Okay, because they sell the righteous for money. Let's look at that phrase. Um, this is an allusion to the purchase of slaves by Edom from the Philistines and the Phoenicians. Okay? You'll find that in Amos 1 6, Amos 1 9. We've already talked about that. This is probably a reference to selling their countrymen into slavery. So, what they were doing 
was they would sell their opponents into slavery into those nations. So they would sell the righteous for money. Literally sell the righteous for money. Okay? So anyone who spoke out against what they were doing, anyone who wanted to call them back to the kind of social justice and that kind of thing that we've talked about, um, it's not the same as we think of social justice today. We wanted to call them back into righteousness and into holiness. All those people, they've sold out into slavery, which is a huge violation of the law. Okay? Um, this term, sell, uh, can be used in two different senses. Uh, often there would be people who were kidnapped um, and sold as slaves, or you would sell yourself into slavery to a creditor to whom you owed a debt. Okay? And you would work off your debt. It's kind of like an indentured servant. This is the former, not the latter. Um, the term righteous here can be used in parallel with a couple of other terms. We see this in Amos 2.6 and in 2.7, the needy, the helpless, the humble. <coughs> so in this context, and note here, context is always king. It doesn't matter what you've heard the interpretation is. If it doesn't match the context, it's not right. Um, it does not have a theological orientation, but a social one. So we're saying those who are calling out the injustice, those who are calling out um, what's wrong, those kind of things. Those who are speaking out against what's being done. Um, righteous people are related to Yahweh and his laws, thereby uh, treat their covenant partners accordingly. Uh, righteousness in Amos has a vertical and horizontal aspect. Um, which means that when we talk about a vertical and a horizontal aspect, um, if, we, if we think about relationship in, uh, with God, right? There's a relationship with God. There's a part that we live out this way, right? Which is what we would say toward people, okay? So if we think, that this, if we, we think righteousness... The scale. There's, there's a righteousness that we live out toward people, which is how we conduct ourselves, how we live. Then there's this righteousness that goes up, and this is toward God. Okay, this is allowing God to be kind of the the center of our life. Right, it's the righteousness that goes up. Um, but again, this is how we live our life toward people in righteousness. This is how we live our life toward God in righteousness. So Amos has these two, these two views in mind when he uses this word. Okay? So the people who are living out their life toward others in righteousness are the needy, the helpless, all those people who are calling attention to the fact that Israel is not living in righteousness. Because their righteousness is people-oriented, but it's also showing that their righteousness is God-oriented because they're, they're living out the Tanakh. All right, and so they are the ones who are being predated upon by the the the, the elite in Israel. Does that make sense? Yes, no, maybe so. You lost me. I'm just. So. No, sometimes you explain things, but then you go on and on and on with it, and then I get lost. I'm sorry. No, this is, this is talking about how he's using this term. So he's talking about righteousness, right? So what is righteousness? It's the people. Righteousness, we've defined righteousness, right, as um, the standard of right. Okay. Okay. Proper living. Proper living. Yeah. Uh -huh. So there's an aspect, even in our lives, even today, in which there's a standard of right in the way that we treat people. So that's a horizontal righteousness. That's, that's on the same plane. Then there's a standard of right that we live toward God, right? Which is following what he, the, the teachings of, that, that we've been given, right? That's a standard of righteousness toward God. So that's the horizontal. So when, when Amos is using this word, he's got both things in mind. Uh -huh. The righteousness that we live out toward people and the righteousness we live out toward God. But he's not just talking about like a theological, you know, abstract concept of righteousness. 
You're talking about practical, livable righteousness. And that's who's been sold into slavery. So it, isn't that like the parallel to people, the righteousness, is like how we act out? Yeah, as, absolutely. As God's... Yeah. Rather in theologically, God say, you know, you should be faithful to God and all that, all those talking. But the, the parallel one is to your, really uh, your action. Yeah, so if we were to think about this, what does Jesus say the greatest commandment is? Love the Lord your God. Right? Love the Lord your God, which is vertical righteousness, and love your neighbor as yourself which is that horizontal righteousness. That's what Israel isn't doing. And that's how Amos is using that term. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Because what does Jesus say about that commandment? On this commandment hangs all of the law and, prophets. Law and the prophets. Amos is a prophet. So when Amos is talking about righteousness, this is what he's talking about. Okay? Um, and the need for a pair of sandals. Um, yeah, we have that. Uh, this may be interpreted literally as meaning people who were bought and sold for a very small amount or who were um, bought and sold in a court procedure. So that can be a number of different things, but really it's probably the people who were bought and sold for a small amount. Um, so, that's what uh, Israel is doing right now, and it's profane. Uh, it profanes God's holy name, so that's why he's, he's upset about it. <laughs> uh, a man and his father resort to the same girl. Um, this term for girl here is not the normal term for a cult prostitute. Right? That was a thing that was going on then. But there was cultural prostitu cult prostitution used in worship. Because remember, Baal is, uh, and, and his wife Ashtoreth are fertility symbols. And so part of the worship was going in and visiting with cult prostitutes. Um, although it may be referring to that. But it could also refer to selling a, uh, a poor young maiden, uh, whereby she would be used as a concubine for all the men in the family. So that was another way that they would do this. So when, when it's... So you can see how this, this relational righteousness, this relational love toward people is lacking in Israel. And this is why he is, uh, why God is so upset with Israel, why Amos is, is being called to go to Israel and preach um, this message to give them this prophecy. Um, these acts that they were doing, we see all of them that we've seen or that we've seen so far, uh, were flaunted at the shrines in front of the golden calves of Jeroboam II, at Bethel, and at Dan. Um, they had the appearance of legality and righteous approval, but everyone knew what was happening and everyone knew it was wrong. Why did everyone or how did everyone know it was wrong? Conscience. They had God gives everybody conscience. They had the objective moral standard of the law. Right? On how they should treat people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they are not doing justice to everybody. Um, so, um, anyway, so Jeroboam II, they have this, um, they're profaning God's holy name, they're defiling it, defiling his name sexually, ceremonially, um, by polluting it with these cultic practices and by worshiping the golden calf, which harkens back to what story? What account? Golden calf. Oh, Moses. Moses, and when he goes up on Mount Sinai, and they're down there making a golden, yeah, a golden calf, calf, golden to, calf worship. to worship. So it kind of harkens back to that. God wanted to destroy them then, and what happens? Moses pleaded for their lives. Moses pleaded for the lives. God said, I will destroy them all and I'll start over with you. And Moses said, no, don't do that. Destroy me instead. Let yeah. them live. Right. And he's like, because of what you've done, I'll spare them, right? So, um, 
Now they have not only built one calf, but they've built two calves and are worship, worshiping them. And so now God is going to destroy them. <laughs> All right? There's no Moses here interceding on their behalf. All right. Um, the garments thing is a little weird, okay? So the rich were uh, taking and keeping um, the, poor, uh, the cloaks or the outer garments, the sleeping garments of the poor as a pledge for loans. So in the ancient Near East, they had like a cloak that they would use to keep warm. They didn't really use blankets. They used these cloaks that were heavy. They, they were used to keep you warm, keep you safe. It does get cold in Israel. It snows. Um, and so they would use these outer cloaks to keep themselves warm. Think like a, a jacket, but you know, they're, they're full of like, They're called overcoats now. Yeah, yeah. Trench, think like a trench coat, but Overcoat much heavier. Though. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. And so they would take these cloaks. You see Jesus kind of referencing this, this too. If a man wants the shirt off your back, give him your cloak also. You were not supposed to take the cloak from somebody. Okay. And it's against the, 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 the law. And by that I mean the capital L law. You weren't supposed to do that. Because you're depriving somebody of something they need to live. You're de depriving them of this outer covering that keeps them safe at night. Because it does get very cold in the desert at nighttime. And something that keeps them warm in the winter. All right? Um, so, yeah, they were keeping those, um, which, is, uh, which is not good. Uh, which is, again, against the law. In the house of their God, they drank wine for those who have been fined. Um, in the cultic centers of Dan and Bethel, the rich were becoming intoxicated on revenue that they illegally extracted from the poor. That's <coughs> what that's getting at. <coughs> okay? Um, and then the other thing that, that uh, also uh, was being done was that temple taxes. Because, um, you know, as you would go into the temple, and we see this happening in um, even in Jesus' days, you would pay your temple tax, right? In order to go into the temple, you had to pay your temple tax. This was a very common practice of the entire ancient Near East. It was for the upkeep of the temple. It was for purchasing food for the Levites, stuff like that, okay? Um, even in pagan, pagan temples, you have this practice also. You bring, in order to <coughs> avail yourselves of the services of the temple, you had to pay the temple tax. What they're doing here is that they're using the temple tax to, uh, for the rich, the rich are confiscating the temple tax and using it to get drunk and using it to um, do these um, sexual practices that are being judged here. Um, one more section, uh, starting in verse 9 of chapter 2. Yet it was I who destroyed the Amorite before them, uh, though his height was like the height of cedars, and he was strong as the oaks. All right, again, this is very, the imagery here mm -hmm. is talking about just how mighty, how tall they appeared. They're not actually the height of cedars. <laughs> um, I, I, uh, I even destroyed his fruit above the root and below. Uh, it was I who brought you up from the land of Egypt and led you in the wilderness for 40 years that you might pos take possession of the land of the Amorite. Then I raised up your sons to be prophets and some of your young men to be Nazare Nazarites. Um, it is, is this not so, O sons of Israel, declares the Lord? But you have made the Nazarites drink wine, and you have commanded the prophets, saying, You shall not prophesy. Behold, I am weighted down beneath you, as the wagon is weighted down when, it, when filled with the sheaves. <coughs> uh, flight will perish from the swift, and the stalwart will not strengthen his power. Nor the mighty man save his life. He who grasps the bow will not stand his ground. The swift foot will not escape, nor will he who rides the horse save his life. Even the bravest among the warriors will flee naked in that day, declares the Lord. Okay, so as I destroyed the Amorite, this term is referring to the holy war um, that, that Yahweh was fighting on behalf of his people. Um, he's pointing out that the victory belonged to him and not to the people. I mean, if you look at some of these battles that Joshua fought going into the land, there's no way that you could say that, that was anybody but God, right? So... That's kind of what he's getting at. Um, though his height, again, this is an imagery for power using trees. Um, I destroyed his, above, his root from above and from below. This is an idiom uh, a, or a proverb, a total destruction of the Amorite people. And we see God utterly destroying them. So he's saying, cut them off from the land. 
Um, it was Ayabacho, but the land of Egypt, obviously, that's, excuse me, the Exodus. Um, led to the wilderness for 40 years. Why did they wander around the wilderness for 40 years? Because they don't want the first generation of the Israelite like, go into the promised land. Why? Because they didn't, um, they didn't follow the God's commandment to uh, <coughs> want to go in relation of the, uh -huh. the promised land. <coughs> yeah. So they didn't believe the faithful spies who were? Right. Who were Joshua, Joshua and, and uh, Caleb. 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 So Joshua and Caleb are the only ones in their families, okay. their families believe them, to go in that were still left. Everyone else from that generation died off. It took them 40 years. That's, that's, what, he's, that's what he was referring to. Um, um, that you might take possession of the land of the Amorites. I raise up your sons to be prophet Nazarites. Um, Nazarites are really unique, okay? There's, in number six, we find the Nazarite vow. All right. Some people will say that Jesus took the Nazarite vow. This is not true. If you've heard that, one thing the Nazarites cannot do is drink wine. What is one thing that Jesus did? He drank wine. He drank wine. Nazarites cannot touch a dead body. Jesus touched dead bodies. And raised it from the dead. And raised it from the dead. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Jesus, we don't know if Jesus cut his hair or not, because we can't say that from Scripture, but that was the other part of that. So the three parts of a Nazarite vow. This was somebody who set aside um, this special vow. Um, was a way for people who weren't priests or Levites, okay, to dedicate themselves to God in a special sense. Mm. Um, it was also significant that in a male-dominated society, that Israelite women were allowed to become Nazarites. Say that again. Israelite women were allowed to become Nazarites. Oh. Okay, so they couldn't serve as priests, they couldn't serve as Levites, but they could serve as Nazarites. Okay? Um, so, anyway. Um, but yeah, that's the three that's the three stipulations. Um, or three of the unique ones. You cannot eat the product from, cannot eat product from the grapevine, which means you also can't drink it. Um, cannot cut your hair. Um, and you cannot touch a dead body. So you find this in number six, three through seven. Um, is where you find those uh, specific things. Um, so what were they doing to, this, to the Nazarites, the people who had taken the Nazarite vow in their area? They were forcing them to break their vow by making them drink. Okay? That's the implication. That's what Scripture says. So um, we'll uh, continue just through this next little, uh, through the end of this passage that we just read. Um, is it not so? Um, so what God does here is he, he looks at the Israelites and say, uh, uh, the, the northern ten tribes, and says, uh, uh, am I wrong? Is it not so that you have done these things? Because, again, Amos is now, to his, to the, the focus of his wrath for, for God has shifted from the, the, the nations that are surrounding Israel to Judah, and now he's turned his ire on uh, Israel itself. And Israel at this point is maybe like, whoa, we don't do those things. Right? What are you talking about? And God says, really? Is it not so? Am I lying? Okay. Um, so God uh, is encouraging them to look at his words, to judge the trustworthiness of those words, and see if they don't comport with reality. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mary, you had a question? Yeah, I, I was thinking if they force the last one to drink wine, is the purpose to de destroy them? Or is that what? Yeah, to make them violate their vow. Because oh, okay. remember, the Nazarites were probably were probably some of those people who were standing against oh. what they were, what what the what the 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 people who were taking advantage of of everyone were doing. Oh. And so, if we can get you to break your vow, maybe we can get you to oh. you know join us or whatever. Um, so, uh, so they, the Nazarites, they get drunk, and then they tell the prophets they can't speak, right? So you're basically, you're, you're taking the, the holy, the people who have been set aside for specific service, and you're telling them you can't serve anymore, okay? Um, uh, so, declares the Lord, we see this phrase a lot in prophecy. And it just is a special phrase to denote that this is God's revelation, this is not something that the prophet is saying. 
So sometimes we'll see stuff where the prophets, like, they, they elucidate a little bit. They give commentary on what they've said. But whenever they're speaking for the Lord directly, they will always say, thus says the Lord, or thus declares the Lord, or this is the word of the Lord, this is what the Lord says. They're always very clear to denote that when they're speaking, and then when the Lord is speaking. So like, for example, Nathan, when he confronts David, Nathan gives a little bit of, a, of an anecdote, right? He's saying about the sheep and, and all of that. You can go back and read that story later if you want. But um, when it comes to the point where he says, you are the man, right? He's speaking on behalf of God. You are the man, declares the Lord. Right? So at first he's just speaking. He's just giving David a story. He's not actually speaking for God. Okay? In other places we see Isaiah talking giving commentary, and then he's not saying, thus says the Lord. And then you've got in other places in Isaiah where he says, thus says the Lord. Um, we see Hosea doing this too. Hosea will often have a conversation with his wife. That's not prophecy. It's only prophecy when he's saying, thus says the Lord, right? Oh. So that's when, you've got to, that's when you've got to differentiate. That's how they set the quotation marks, as it were, around what God is saying. So when they say declare the law, that means really is what the law actually said. Uh, yes, so whether you want to take that as um, God is whispering in the ear of the prophet exactly what should be said, yeah. or God is giving the prophet an unction as to what to say, right. and God is letting the prophet communicate. Or the um, other injection of the prophet saying is that he cannot say that, right? I mean... I mean, like Nathan tells, yeah, yeah, yeah. telling the story, which is not God tells him to tell the story. Yeah, that way. 